next next year. Mm-hmm. I will wait mm-hmm. until the human start with the written language. Then I will come back to visit the language again. So let me start share screen first. Okay, I'm going to show you a screen which is from a video. Okay, let's play that. Thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting PBS Digital Studios. About two and a half million years ago, in the middle of Wash Valley of Ethiopia, one of our ancient human ancestors, or maybe a group of them, crouched over a carcass of an antelope on the shore of a lake. One of these hominins took a sharp stone flake and sliced into the flesh on the inside of the jaw, grazing the bone and leaving three cut marks. These ancestors were after the meaty tongue of the animal, and in trying to remove it, they left traces of this remarkable moment, the use of a tool by a human ancestor. They also left behind the technology itself in the form of a few scattered stone tools. This site, now known as Bori, is one of the earliest confirmed locations where a human ancestor or relative permanently modified some part of the environment around them to suit their needs, chipping raw stone into a tool. In the broadest sense, this is what technology is, making tools and using them to interact with the world around you. These simple stone flakes and the cores of rock they were struck from are what anthropologists call Oldowan tools, named for the Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania where they were found. And while these tools don't seem like much when you're comparing them to the screen you're watching right now, their creation represents a pivotal moment in the origin of technology and in the evolution of our lineage. This is when our ancestors first started to make the world around them fit their needs. But what they didn't know at the time was that this use of technology would change them too. Because the fact is, the use of tools has not only enabled our lineage to take over the world, it has also shaped our very biology, from our brains to our skeletons. Of course, hominins didn't invent the use of tools. The first of our ancestors to make and use technologies like the Oldowan tools were just expanding on the behavior of our primate ancestors and cousins. Chimpanzees, our closest living relatives, and capuchin monkeys, a much more distant branch on our family tree, make and use tools to get at choice foods like termites and nuts. But hominins, the branch of our family tree that's more closely related to us than to chimps and bonobos, took things a step further. They created permanent tools out of carefully chosen materials that were then sometimes carried around and reused. And the Oldowan instruments weren't the first tools that hominins ever made. In 2011, anthropologists working in West Turkana, Kenya, found evidence of a different type of stone tool that predates the Oldowan by around 700,000 years. These tools are even simpler than Oldowan choppers and flint. Lakes. They're called Lomequion tools after the site of Lomequi where they were found, and they're dated to 3.3 million years ago. They also seem to have been made in a different way. Oldowan tools were made by hominins holding rocks in both hands and striking them together. But Lomequian tools seem to have been made by holding only one rock and striking it against another that was sitting on a flat base or against the flat base itself to break it and create a sharp edge. And it seems likely that the tool makers of Lomequi were doing this for the same reasons that hominins at Bori were, to try to get hidden foods like bone marrow or the insides of hard-shelled nuts. But we don't know for sure, because unlike at Bori, the Lomequi hominins didn't leave behind butchered bones. Still, in both cases, these tools allowed our early ancestors to get at more nutritious foods more often. And this might have kickstarted a feedback loop that affected our bodies forever, starting with our brains. We don't know for sure who the tool makers at Lomequi and Bori were, but they were most likely Australopithecines, members of that early and diverse group of hominins found mostly in Eastern and Southern Africa. And members of this genus typically had smaller brains and smaller bodies than hominins that followed them, the early members of our genus Homo, who appeared on the scene in Eastern Africa around 2.4 million years ago. These early members of our genus probably used Oldowan tools too, like the hominins at Bori, and the ancestors that used these tools seem to do pretty well for themselves. For example, the earliest known site with clear evidence of long-term and consistent meat-eating is an Oldowan site called Kanjera South in Kenya, dated to about 2 million years ago. Over a period of hundreds to thousands of years, the hominins there acquired and butchered many small ungulates, like gazelles and occasionally larger antelope. 
And all that meat and marrow is really high in calories compared to things like fruit and tubers. So regular access to all those calories might have paved the way for our large brains and in turn further technological innovation. Now the next phase in the history of our tool use is where things get even more interesting and more complicated, because this is where we start to find tools outside of Africa, but we're not sure who made them. The traditional story from this point in the anthropological record is that a little less than 2 million years ago, we see both a new hominin and a new, more complicated type of tool emerge. This is when Homo erectus makes its first appearance in Africa about 1.9 million years ago. And this species had a larger brain, larger body, and smaller teeth compared to earlier hominins, all hallmarks of a higher quality diet. Brains are especially expensive when it comes to how many calories they require to develop and to maintain, and so are larger, more muscular bodies. So it was thought that this might explain why a new, more sophisticated toolkit started to appear regularly around 1.7 million years ago. These were large cutting tools, including things like hand axes, which are made by flaking hand-sized rocks to a point on both sides with a rounded end for gripping. These newer, more complex instruments became known as the Australian Toolkit. And until very recently, those tools were thought to have been first made by African members of Homo erectus, and this development was seen as the next pivotal step in our ancestors' use of tools. But new finds from China might make this story much more complicated. In 2018, researchers published their discovery of Australian tools from the site of Shengqin, which were dated to 2.1 million years old. That date pushes back the appearance of Australian technology by some 400,000 years. And it's also 300,000 years before the time when the earliest hominins were thought to have made it out of Africa. The earliest known fossils of human ancestors that we found outside of Africa belong to a population of Homo erectus, found at a site called Demani Sea in the Republic of Georgia, dated to 1.8 million years ago. But who made the tools found in China is still unknown. The general consensus is that it was probably Homo erectus, because fossils of Homo erectus have been found at another site in China that are 1.7 million years old, so we know they made it there at some point. But other researchers have suggested that maybe it was an earlier member of the genus Homo that made the tools, like maybe Homo habilis. It'll take more research to figure out what exactly is going on here, but that's part of what makes paleoanthropology so interesting. New discoveries are made all the time. And all of these technological innovations, from the very simplest to the more complex stone tools, were major breakthroughs for our lineage. For our Australopithecine ancestors, the use of tools meant that they could incorporate more animal resources, like meat and bone marrow, into their diets, consuming more calories than they'd been able to before. And more calories meant more available energy, allowing those early hominins to develop and maintain larger brains and bodies over time, leading to taxa like Homo erectus. And the very circuitry of our brains might have also started to change when we began making and using tools. In 2008, researchers at a medical school in India Indiana used PET scans to study the brains of modern expert stone toolmakers while they made Oldowan and Ashulean tools. And the scan showed that toolmaking activated parts of the brain associated with visual motor coordination and planning. Demands in those parts of the brain also grew as the toolmaking became more complex. So the researchers concluded that these neural signatures of toolmaking may suggest that our brains and our technological capabilities may have co-evolved. And of course, the act of tool making may have also had an effect on what we use to make them, our hands. In 2018, a team of anthropologists conducted an experiment to learn more about how the biomechanical stresses of tool making might have shaped our anatomy. Their study subjects wore special gloves with sensors in them and then did things like nut cracking, breaking bones for marrow, and making stone tools to see how much stress these things placed on each of their fingers. And the research showed that the two activities that created the most stress were breaking bones for marrow and making stone flakes using hammer stones. So these two activities might have been particularly important in driving the evolution of our hands because using tools in these ways would have exerted powerful selective pressures on things like increased stability and better gripping ability, and maybe even having bigger, stronger thumbs. From the size of our bodies to the wiring of our brains and the capability of our hands, we owe some incredibly important aspects of our modern anatomy to stone tools. But of course, they were only the beginning of our capacity for technology. Their legacy continues to this day, and the reason you can watch me talk to you right now is because of our always evolving ability to create new things to help us interact with the world around us. Thank you to CuriosityStream for supporting PBS Digital Studios. 
Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers documentaries and nonfiction titles from a variety of filmmakers, including Curiosity Stream originals. For example, you could watch Deep Time History, the story of how our evolution has been shaped by forces you might not have thought of, not just our biology, but also the physics, geology, and chemistry of the natural world. You can learn more at curiositystream.com slash eons. Thanks for joining me today in the newly named Constantine Hassa Studio, and an extra big thanks to our current eontologist. Jake Hart, John Ivy, John Davison Ng, and Steve. If you'd like to join them and our other patrons in supporting what we do here, then go to patreon.com slash eons and make your pledge. Now, what do you want to learn about? Leave us a comment and don't forget to go to youtube.com slash eons and subscribe. Okay. So I think I will leave more time for discussion. Any, any, any question? I mean, rather than a question, um, and I think we've, I've mentioned this before. In that video, um, she's talking about um, um, near relatives of Homo sapiens who've invented tools, but one of the other animals other mammals that's invented tools is the badger who would have needed tools to um, uh, to make um, dams etc actually and animals there's a lot of animals do use tools uh, I think the birds making nests is selectively you are uh, selecting something to make up the net, the nets, so that is again a tool yeah. use, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But um, then uh, the next step is of course not just selecting. When you have selected something, you modify it. For example, the the uh, simple chimpanzees will take a a straw or something like that, and then pull it through their teeth to make it into finer pieces in order to. Uh, get more termites or ants to eat. So that is a modification of a found object. And then when, we, when humans started to, I think that will have happened much earlier. I think humans will have uh, similar activities. But unfortunately, this thing doesn't last. <laughs> Modifying a, 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 a straw into more finer pieces, it doesn't last. So you uh. do not leave a... Um, record behind, but the stone tools do leave a record behind, and that's that's why we we will have to stop talk about stone tools. But obviously, before that, there will be a lot of other tools, maybe even baskets made from similar for the for the uh, birds to make nests. Human might be weaving um grass or other other material to in order for, to help them carry things around. When they are hunter-gathering, okay, they, they, they might, we always think that the, the hunter-gatherers will be carrying everything on their back, but we have only two hands. <laughs> How many things you can carry? So obviously, um, when they're moving around, uh, just like the, the non-romantic non people today, they will have to carry quite a bit of things when they change camp from one campsite to other campsite. So I will think um, there's a lot of other other tools being made, but for stone we are talking about a couple of million years ago. So at that time, how how developed we are, we don't know because uh, Homo sapiens is having lasted two hundred million, uh, haven't last two million years. We last about. 200,000, so there's a fast scratch. So that must be made by other homo species. Yeah, look, I think the point you made um, about modification is very, very important. Modifying um, an instrument is probably um, a bigger deal than just picking up a stone to use it. Yeah. But that raises the question um when does 
when does modification begin? Now, what I mean is um, an animal who's walking along and kicking a stone out of its way so that it can move, um, is that modification? Or uh, breaking out a branch from the tree? Yeah. Selectively, well, I, I like this branch, not that branch, and selectively picking one branch than the other. That, that is, yeah. There is a lot of uh, cognitive behavior behind it. Yeah. Yes, obviously, yes. So, again, the, the whole issue about human development is, again, when, when is the, the cognitive development involved? In what direction? We have been uh, proposing a number of a number of possibilities. First of all, we talk about fire. Fire enable us to eat cooked fruit. With eating cooked fruit, that means we get more energy, and that that will be a prerequisite. But again, maintaining fire or maintaining a hot hot um, heat source is a lot of cognitive behavior. So the assumption now is that uh, at some point in the past, humans able to find a naturally occurring heat source like the lava and then make use of that one. Now, You're talking about um, cooking meat. Yeah, cooking meat now, or cooking anything. Okay? But, ah, but now the equivalent with cooking meat with vegetables is, in my opinion, growing vegetables rather than just hoping one comes across the vegetable that one wants. But well, taking the seeds and putting them in the ground and fertilizing them. Uh, now that, the question that, that is comes which much came later, first right? no. cooking meat or growing vegetables? We we know that because that, that comes much later. That's the agriculture. Agriculture comes much later. But before that Probably they will have some kind of stick to duck up the roots yes. of some edible roots. Yes. And the roots so themselves may not be edible. Comes... Like the Australian Aborigines. Yeah. Like like our Aborigines. They they know what kind of plants you can dig up the roots and then cook the roots in order to, to eat it. So that is that is a, a, again you I would suppose they will have find some kind of stick which is especially helpful for them to take. But unfortunately, this kind of stick doesn't last. <laughs> so yeah. we don't yeah. have... A new one. Mm. We don't have a record of seeing we, that. We're using fire about... Homo erectus is using fire about 1.7 million years ago. Yeah. But uh, we're farming, what? Maybe it, 7 million years ago, eight. Seven million, seven thousand years ago. Seven, yeah. It's an enormous. We're mostly a hunter gatherer. Yeah. All the rest is just tacked on the end. Yeah. I don't think we've changed much from being a hunter gatherer. We wouldn't have had time to change much. Oh, uh, we do change a little, uh, uh, quite a bit from uh, mm -hmm. because from hunter gatherers into farmers, uh, we know that the human size decreased. Our size nutrition. Decreased. Nutrition uh, lowered. All right. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, of course, we are rebounding now uh, with modern technology in the last hundred years or so. We are rebounding back. Our, our children is usually larger than we are. Well, yeah. You were saying, Valerie, about um, the Aborigines. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's interesting... Um, the way they cook meat was um, surprisingly um, sophisticated. They would heat stones in the fire and um, cook the meat on the the stone. So you you've got a, a sort of a um, a wok or um, um, a frying pan. Um, very, very early, thousand, tens of thousands of years ago. Well, in one of the Cantonese uh, show I did um, is related to popular science, which is every uh, 
Friday at 10 o'clock uh, evening our time here. But that's in Cantonese. We talk about the cooking methodology. How many ways you can cook things? Of course, uh, that one we are not talking about history. We are talking about today. What kind, How many different ways we are cooking? And there are some new ways which is only invented recently. For example, we have uh, the air oven. Yeah. Where yeah. And with, the microwave. And the microwave. Microwave is very new. Yeah, very new. Very new. And then uh, recently we also have those so-called, um, uh, what's that called? Um, highly controlled temperature uh, water bath. Yeah, yes. The, Everyone's got one of those. The Prime Minister bought one on taxpayers' <laughs> money. Is that <laughs> But Scotty from you, marketing's got one. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need heat, heat to cook. You can marinate. And I think yeah. we've discussed this before. Ah, mm. Yeah. yeah. Mar marination is one thing. And then we, we also have now very yeah. sophisticated heating instruments controlling the temperature to tens of a degree. Very precise control. And that is... It, before that, we have no, no, uh, we can't do it. I, I remember when I was in a uh, form four, so that will be about year ten, here. Uh, our biology teachers um uh, asked us to hatch some chicken. Oh, yes. Okay. At that time, when I was <laughs> at uh year ten, equivalent and. We go out to the new territories, get some um, fertilized eggs, bring it back to school, and then uh, take it to the physics laboratory and uh, radiate them with some radiation. And then we have to, um, two students at a time, looking after the uh, warming of, of the eggs. We have no thermistors, so we are looking at a tap, uh, thermometer, turning on and off a lamp in order to keep the temperature. <laughs> I just, I can't remember how. We have to do it 24 hours a day. So <laughs> we have to turn at, at night in the lab, lab two, two of us together, looking after the, the hatching of the eggs, making sure that the temperature is correct. I can't remember what's the temperature, but but... We are the thermistor. We we had to switch on and off the lamp in order to control the temperature. That was very fun. But it lasts for in my memory memory. But again now, I think at that time our temperature can maintain at about one degree or two degrees is already very good. But now with this technology we are able to control it to point yeah. one of a degree. That is remarkable. We also have been uh, talking about other cooking mechanis uh, me mechanisms. In, in Chinese, the number of ways to cook is, is so vast. We have, uh, of course, roasting, which is not our favorite way of cooking. We have stir fry, we have steaming, we have uh, frying. Uh, even for frying, we have a shallow fry and the deep frying. And then uh, mineration, different kinds of mineralates and so forth. Human had developed a lot of eating skills over, over that many time. That is only possible because we have time at our hand. We don't eat, need to eat 24 hours a day. <laughs> and then there's a lot of time we can spend in. So now back to this this. All this issue, the the development of language is what how obviously language will help the tools making to uh, continue through generations. We need learning in order to 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 make tools. The learning can be two ways by more, by um, copying what is happening. So you watch uh, other other adults making tools, then you attempt. To do it yourself and eventually you're skillful and make, can make tools. So that's one way. The other way is by 
language, teaching the next generation how to how to make tools. So we talked about language last time. So we again these things all interact together. We we it is very difficult to tease out which is more important than the other. So and then we have been using oral language for over hundreds of thousands of years, or maybe seven seven hundred year seven hundred thousand years, but only until recently, about let's say five thousand six thousand years, we have written language, and then only about two thousand years maximum, we have paper to record our our written language, and now, well, as we were discussing last week. Before paper, um, you had um, various other methods um, where uh, the language was engraved. Yeah. And you, you were talking about tortoise shells in, um, in, China. in China, which I, I find fascinating. But um, don't forget um, that... Um, as well as written language, and just as important is body language and um, the use of um, your hands and expressions, etc. Um, there's the story of the Jew who uh, broke his arm and couldn't speak for six weeks. I think. Um... Hand hands a sign language is again very interesting. Mm. Um, if you are like us, we are not. For example, we are not born deaf or or milk. Then you will have to learn the sign language. But for those who are deaf or mute, sign language come to them very easily. They can just. Yeah. So so again, uh, our our brain is being specialized. And that specializations can can be uh, changed to other effort, as, aspect. Yeah. I used to have a young chap working for me who um, was born with hearing difficulties, and he he was incredible at lip reading. So. Mm. What do you mean? Lip reading, reading what I'm saying. Oh, Can't lip reading. Right. Yes, yes. Mm. Uh, when I was searching about language, there is also two terms that come up to me. I find it um, pigeon pigeon language. Was that is that called pigeon language? Pigeon English. Pig yeah. Language which were uh, developed the out of. Yeah. Is that called Bridget? Let me just. And, and then the, the other is Korea. What's that? Korea? Let me just see whether I can find this. Uh, uh, no, where did I put it? I would have put it here, maybe. The Pigeon, um, P I D G I N. Yeah. And that's C R E O L E S. Creole. So, yeah. the difference is the care for carriers. It is. Uh, the language which were what which which was used by a non-native speaker. Uh, no, um, carriers have no native speakers. Pig uh, pigeons is have native speakers, but it is a simplified version of another language. So I am. Okay, let, let me just share this for you. I think this is a very short video. 
Hello everyone, welcome to the Lang Focus channel and my name is Paul. Today we're going to talk about the language of pigeons. Where's the screen? Let, Sorry, let me... I know that joke isn't very good, but... Let me just get this window up and then show it to you. Uh, main window. Okay, main window. Okay. Where's the window? This side? No. Hello everyone, welcome to the Lang Focus channel and my name is Paul. Today we're going to talk about the language of pigeons. I think that this that we we can just listen to it. Sorry, I know that joke isn't very good, but that's all I've got. Today I'm going to talk about some special kinds of languages called pigeons and creoles. You've probably heard those terms before, maybe in the names of certain languages like Pigeon English or Haitian Creole, but please note, there is not just a single pigeon language or a single creole language. They are actually referring to categories of languages. There are many pigeons and many creoles around the world. First, what do they have in common? Well, pigeons and creoles are new languages that develop when speakers of different languages come into contact with each other and have a need to communicate. Many pigeons and creoles have arisen when colonial powers came into contact with local people as they spread around the world. So what's the difference between pigeons and creoles? Well, pigeons are non-native lingua francas, while creoles have native speakers. But let me get into both types of language. First of all, pidgin languages. As I just mentioned, pidgin languages have no native speakers. They're languages that arise very suddenly, very quickly, when there is a need for communication in a certain situation. For example, for trade or for labor. The pidgin language is a sort of compromise between two different languages or between multiple languages. Pidgins usually arise when one group of people is dominant over another group of people, and the less dominant group needs to learn to communicate with the more dominant group. But without any form education in the language of that dominant group, they adopt a sort of simplified language based on the most basic vocabulary of that dominant group's language and based on the most basic grammar of their own native language. This happens most commonly in situations of trade, slavery, or colonial contact. And in a situation like that, the dominant group is usually the colonial power or the most influential trading partner. Imagine this situation. An English-speaking colonial power has a sugar plantation, and they bring over laborers from various different countries to that sugar plantation, and those people speak different languages. But in order to work together, they need to have a common language, so they try to adopt English. But since they do this quickly, and they just adopt the basics, the resulting language is a very simplified language, just using the basic vocabulary of English and a very non-English grammar. That is a pidgin language. When pigeons first develop, they are typically restricted in use, meaning that they are only used for a certain purpose, for example, on the job or for trade. But some pigeons become expanded pigeons, meaning that they begin to be used for all facets of life, including social life, and family life, things like that, and they become languages in their own right. Even though they are not native languages, they are passed down from generation to generation as lingua francas amongst people who speak different native languages. Now about Creole languages. So pigeons have no native speakers. They arise because of the need for a lingua franca. But if that language survives and becomes the native language of the next generation, then it is now a Creole language. For example, slaves from several different countries are working closely together on a plantation, but they have no common language, so they develop their pidgin, and it quickly becomes their expanded pidgin, the language they use for all everyday purposes. Their children grow up in that environment with that pidgin language, and it becomes their native language. That is now a Creole language. In the days when African slaves were brought to the Americas, they were often separated from people who spoke the same native language. That was to prevent them from rebelling or from making plans together, that kind of thing. So in those kinds of situations, the pidgin languages became expanded very quickly and within one generation sometimes became creoles. Some creoles are based on English, for example, Jamaican Creole. Some creoles are based on French, including Haitian Creole, which has 12 million native speakers. And a smaller number of creole languages are based on Spanish, including Chavacano in Philippines. Now, how different are these Creole languages from their parent languages? Well, it depends on the particular language, but let's look at an example. This example is from Bislama, which is an English-based Creole spoken in Vanuatu. The first sentence is, this is my house. In Bislama, hem house blong me. 
or in more standard English phonology, him here house belong me. Another example sentence, I have already been to town. In Bislama, me bin long town finis. Or in standard English phonology, me bin long town finish. So look at each word. Me is like I, been, that's self-explanatory. Long is used as a preposition here instead of an adjective. So long means toward or to. And then we have town, that's like town, and finish. Finish is used instead of already to show that something has been accomplished. So again, you can see that the words are from English, but they're used and arranged in a very different way. And this is what makes it a different language than the parent language. Pigeons and creoles are fascinating because they are proof that languages are living entities that are constantly changing and adapting to the needs of their speakers. Sometimes two or more languages can even join forces and take on a life of their own as a new language. Thank you for watching. Be sure to leave your comments down below and have a nice day. So, as I, another, another thing I just discovered about language is called uh, polylogs. Is that polylogs? People who can speak more than one language. And yeah. uh, I'm also fascinated that uh, people can speak, there are people who can speak more than 20 languages. I, uh, Albert, I was born in Mauritius, like I told you last week, and I, I spoke French Creole. French Creole. Yeah. Yeah, right. because it was a French colony for 150 years and they bought in plantation, sugarcane plantation with, uh, with Indians, laborers and slavery. They had slavery first and then the island was attacked by the British and the English took over and they abolished slavery and they used the Indian laborers from India because Mauritius was is situated on the way to Europe was a route um, for the East India trade. So it's a bit like Jamaica, it was sugarcane. So you speak two languages, not at least. Uh, three languages, I can speak French and French Creole, which is now a recognized language, even though they own dictionary now. It's a bit like South Africa with Afrikaans and Dutch and English. Yeah. So I suppose yeah. Albert speak too. You speak um, the Jew uh, English. Well, well, my knowledge of Hebrew is limited. But about 50 years ago, I had a copy of a... Um, um, oh, what? Um, a, um, a newspaper from... Port Moresby, um, and can you see the title there? No, wait, put it up. Hold it up to the camera. <laughs> if it, a little bit further away. Too close. Still too close. New Guinea Talk. New Guinea, New Guinea talk, talk. Talk, talk, meaning conversation. Talk, talk. Um, yeah. But I believe that um, uh, languages like um, Pidgin English is now considered to be politically incorrect in um, Papua New Guinea. And um, you either speak native languages or um, English, but Pidgin English, no. So, is that similar in um, Mauritius, Gilbert? Is it becoming politically incorrect? No, it's not. It's been maintained because now uh, Mauritius has been a multicultural country for over 100 years because there's been the Indians, the Chinese, uh, all brought in by the French, and, of course, the African slavery, and uh, Muslims, Arabs, and as well. But the, the, the country was first founded, uh, the, the, the Portuguese landed there in the 1500s, and then the Dutch, they stayed there for a few years, and the French, and English, and so it's been multicultural for a long time, but they're very um, proud of their Creole now, their, their language. Were the natives before the um, 
um, before the, the Portuguese arrived? What was that? Were there natives on no, the island? Nothing, nothing. So, so it was completely uninhabited. That's right. It's uh, uh, very small. It's a volcanic island. It's only about 80 kilometres by 150 kilometres. And that's Gilbert, where the, the, the dodo was famous there. And Gilbert, the Dutch ate all the dodos if they said it tasted like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> how long have you lived in Melbourne? Uh, well, I came here as a 13-year-old in 1969. Ah, do you remember there used to be a magnificent Mauritian restaurant in um, uh, Victoria Street opposite the Victoria Market? No, I never went there, no. Oh, look, I used to go there quite regularly. Beautiful food. Yeah, right. Yeah. Obviously, and this Albert loved to eat. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But um, uh, my favourite dish there, um, they had a lot of offal on the menu. Does that yes. sound correct? And um, I like their stewed brains. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Yes, is that a typical dish? My dad liked brains, yeah. I, I was pretty fortunate. My... Uh, Grandmother had Portuguese ancestry, and my father's um, father, my great no, sorry, my great grandfather was a Norwegian sailor. That's how oh, I, got, I have the name Olsen. He was he was uh -huh. shipwreck of the island. So I have a, a, a lot of a mixture of ancestry. <laughs> But uh, yeah, my grandmother was a good cook. She cooked everything in an animal, animal, awful, anything in the animal she ate. She she kept a lot of animals actually. Well, uh, I think uh, when the when the culture becomes long, we go through famine uh, and rich stages, and therefore we yeah. we learn to eat everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, it's interesting. Um, traditionally, um, in European countries, um, the lord of the manor would eat the best cuts, um, then those under him would eat the next cut, and so on and so on. And um, the offal that nobody wanted um, would uh, go down to the peasants. Mm. And it's ironical that today, um, offal is one of the most expensive. expensive. <laughs> yeah, because um, uh, for most animals, it's just chucked out. Yeah. And the small bit that's left for, uh, for connoisseurs of offal, you have yeah. to pay for it. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny how our taste adapts to something you get used to, and then it becomes you need it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, taste is very much cultured. Yeah. You, you, yeah. When you grow up, you develop a certain taste, taste and then that taste uh, follow you. And that's why it's, mother's cook is always the best. Yeah, it's a need. <laughs> it's a drug. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, in terms of language, there's another re reverse happening happened in Hong Kong. Although Hong Kong is a British colony, but um, the main population is still Cantonese who still keep talk, uh, speaking in Cantonese. So mm -hmm. there's uh, some very strange things happens. For example, in Hong Kong, um, the butts is called Basi, and the toast is called Dossi. <laughs> and the taxi is called Dixie. <laughs> yeah. uh, the proper name for them is for, but it, it should be Gong Gong Hei But it simplified to Bats, Basi. Uh, taxi should be Gai Cheng But it simplified to Taxi in Hong Kong. So that is, yeah. that is again, um, something similar of that happened. Is that yeah, yeah. A pigeon, Valerie, a little bit of pigeon, mm. but not you, extensively like a pigeon, which is a 
language by itself, it incorporates into the the most commonly used language in in a very strange way. Mm. Mm. Um, Valerie, you mentioned the aged good food guide ah. um, earlier on. Um, do you remember Rita Early, who used to write? Yes. Uh, um, Rita is actually a member of my synagogue, and some mm. years ago she edited a cookbook of recipes from everybody, and she made a comment about one of my recipes, a family recipe um, for um, pea stew with vinegar and sugar. And she said, oh, you ob your family obviously came from Portugal. And she knew this um, by um, the use of vinegar and sugar together. But vinegar and sugar is also used in a lot of other um, area. I think the Koreans also use a lot of vinegar and sugar together. Of course, they also add uh, uh, chili. So are mm. the Chinese. They they also are, are the Vietnamese. They also use a lot of vinegar. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Of course, I, I'm. Well, Rita was talking about um, from the European. Yeah, angle. she's very Eurocentric. Mm. <laughs> Oh, obviously, the vinegar it might be different kind of vinegar. With with this language, it always intrigued me how long we took to get to have a language that it took us maybe from one point eight million years to about uh, what about half a million years ago to have anything like language. That's a long while for your brain to uh, <laughs> take to mm. get to it. You know, it's amazing to me the humans took so long to get to certain things. But I guess you had a lot of brain development having to yeah. happen and having to eat meat and various things to create the time to do these things. But, uh, you know, we just, we've just we just virtually come out of the trees, haven't we? Time-wise. Time-wise, yeah. yes. <laughs> we barely got here and we're going to blow ourselves up. <laughs> I think a lot of men haven't got it. <laughs> He's waiting for the Collingwood supporters to come out of the tree. But you know. Oh, oh, breaking up. Valerie, you've frozen. Think about the time that they think they died out. Valerie, you froze. We, we lost you. Oh, I've got intermittent uh, problems. I'm just saying it's interesting that Neanderthals, who died out about 40,000 years ago, would have just had language. I mean, language was only just being found, and the neck bones were only just being found in fossils to have been capable of producing the sounds of a proper language. So did sapiens get the upper hand because they had language? I, I think because we, we need to be very for a long time to eat very salt food yeah. in order to lessen to reduce the strength mm -hmm. of these muscles in order to, to allow us to speak like that. So it mm -hmm. it it will take a long time as very point out for a proper language to develop. But it's also interesting. Once the language developed, it changed so much that there are so many different languages. Oh. Yeah, and it must have changed our brains. Yeah. Changed this. This must have been bigger, this front bit. Yeah. You know, because it's all up here. But did sapiens get the upper hand on the Neanderthals because they had language? Probably. Uh, there's another, another interesting thing is uh, in the cognitive development, uh, yeah. when are we able to, to uh, abstract? to draw abstract ideas. And is that because of this? Yeah, it's also because, so <laughs> the, the other interesting thing is to look at is, uh, I probably will be looking at it next time is, when is the first so-called art develops? Yeah. Art is a, a abstract expression. So probably mm. art will develop after language, but 
art will be one step. Maybe art is also will drive our language as well. Yeah, they they, they have to have the art to have the language. Yeah, because language need mm. to be able to express very abstract ideas. So that whether the abstract ideas come first or the language come first or they they call you off. Well, art is very old. Look at um, mm. uh, the First Nation cave paintings. Mm. Um, which go back tens of thousands. Of, I, mm. I think they're now talking about sixty thousand years. Yeah, the first, about um, about sixty eighty thousand years. Uh, and and I think they they also bespeak that we might have had to have a, some meat eating or some some calorie dense food to give us time to stand around painting things. Yeah, you know? and have time to do other things, but including painting. Food. Yeah. Mm. We, we, we need that uh, energy concentration food. So again, yeah. food is very important in our development. Yeah. But food with the everything. food, then come to some point, then we have language, and the language and abstract thinking must be co-evolving because that yeah. is changing All our brain. What's going on up here? Yeah. Mm. So, Not in the back of the head. <laughs> so there is another clue when our brain actually develops is looking at those very old arts. Yeah. Yeah. But it's still that not art, that long ago. It's, it's about 80,000 to 70,000 yeah, years ago. Compared to uh, 1.8 million years, it took a heck of a long time for this thing to develop. Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing that um, art and um, tools have in common is the use of the hand, that you need the thumb, which is at an angle to the other fingers. Yeah. Um, so that you can hold your tool, and you need a tool for um, for painting. Yeah, you look at the uh, how other animals uh, use tools. They their handling of the tools is very very limited. Unlike us, we our hand is very very skillful in manipulating tiny movements. Tiny mm. movements we can write. We can write those states are very tiny movement. I think a lot of animals can't do that. Even they might have abilities of picking up some very small things like the elephants. But in terms of smaller uh, motions, they are quite limited. So there is a, another, we, we need. We can use that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The ultimate, yeah. the ultimate yeah. in fine motor control. But it's much uh it develops much earlier than in girl children than in boy children. Always a kindergarten's nightmare is getting boys' fine motor control developed. Why? Why? <laughs> uh, sorry, again. You mean uh, girls have fine motor control yes, earlier much than earlier, females? Much earlier than boys. Oh. But yeah. how much? How many years? Oh, about a year. When you're three or four, that's a... Yeah, that's life. a hell of a lot, yes. A little girl will do this. You watch her. She'll turn the page like this. You won't see a boy do that for ages. It's a, it's a nightmare for uh, preschool teachers because mm. the girls are so different in that development of that fine motor control, and we don't know why. But, um, I can't see an evolutionary reason for it. Well, maybe the it's related are... to our hunter-gathering the, the uh, job division. Women will be weaving, uh, weaving clothes, making mm, threads. Possibly. Whereas possibly. men will be making um, arrows. And because men is more inclined to do the so-called heavy lifting, lifting but more the, the, the major done. muscles. The little boys are with mum collecting the uh, tubers. Uh, this continues. It's not only in um, uh, young children. Right, uh, right into adulthood, the um, the girl is about twelve months in advance of the boy, mm. and this is why, in so many marriages, um, the um, the male is the elder partner um, on average by one or two years. I was thinking of how they used to use the children and the, the women children in the uh, cotton mills in Lancashire because they had to handle that fine thread, you know? Yeah. And you see those carpet makers with the silk carpet in Iran <coughs> going blind. 
but they're using very fine motor control. Yeah, it's such an interesting thing. Why evolution has somehow favoured this? Well, because be, I think because we have cooked the food. One of the the, the consequence of cooked the food is you, the cooking will have all the smell coming going a long way, and therefore you need protector. So when women start to cook food, then the man becomes the protect, protection. And that is the beginning of the division of labor between male mm. and female. But again, why not the other way around? So probably because um, the female collected most of, by collecting, gathering, and therefore the gathered food had to be cooked. Whereas animals might not, need not be cooked. So that is that causes uh the division of labor between men and women maybe yeah it's just interesting but uh, the language development school because i think women also uh, do language better than men and the men do other things better yeah so just interesting how they've developed this because i think it's changed the brain it's enough to be inherited you know well, not a lot just, of people say not it, just cultural. A lot of people say it's the hormone. Is that the hormone or is yeah, the brain it could be structure? Yeah, the hormone getting different genes to express. But when for young boys and girls, the hormones doesn't kick in, isn't it? Not there. So no. don't know. It maybe is the is the. Well, that gives me a direction to to search Ooh. to see if Any, there's any new yeah. thing that we can take up. Oh, but. Uh, we better let you go and open up China today. Okay. We'll see you then around the corner. <laughs> so I'm I'm going straight over. I will be there. Okay. I will look for you. Well, I'll use um I'll use the link I've used before. Okay. Yes, just use the old link. It seems yeah. to work. Yeah, okay. Anyway. See you there.